if somebody doesn't know, my name is Andrei, and today I'm going to preach. The topic or the text that I have chosen today for our uh, for our meditation it's in Hebrews chapter 11. It's uh, a passage about the faith. It's just said about Christians that we walk by faith, not by vision. So we are people of faith. Faith in the life of Christian uh, is extremely important. It has to do with <coughs> how a person is saved. It's a matter of our uh, relationship with God is, is a big part of our life. Therefore, we'll consider what the faith is and what it is not. <coughs> there are different understanding. There is different understanding about faith and uh, it just the world in which we live. So usually people think about faith this: you you believe in your soul, or uh, it's not important what you believe is, in what you believe into, but it's important just to believe something because all the roads lead to God, so it doesn't really matter what you believe in, it's important just to believe something. <coughs> but we know that, <coughs> of course, the faith described in the, in the Bible is totally different. Let's read the text and then we'll uh, see what faith is all about. So it's Hebrews 11, we'll read verses 1 through 10, though of course we will not be able to go through all of them today, but so now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. <coughs> this is what the ancients were commanded for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was commanded as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith he still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith Enoch was taken from his life so that he didn't experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. But for before he was taken he was commanded as one who pleased God. And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his in inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs of, with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. <coughs> of course, it would be nice to talk about the end of faith, the, the, the ultimate final of faith. It will be a great uh, ending of history, heavenly Jerusalem, God's, God's kingdom into which we go. Our faith is not just fanatical faith, it has some meaning, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we will, unfortunately, we will not be able to talk about that part of faith, uh, but we'll talk about different aspects of faith. In the first four worthies, we see various characteristics of faith, not all of them, but some of them. And then, starting with verse 5, actually from verse 4, we see how this faith uh, was uh, uh, <coughs> con was expressed in the life of various people. So first, uh, it is described what the faith is and its uh, characteristics, and then how it uh, happened in reality in life of real people. If you read Hebrews, uh, probably you noticed uh, throughout the first 10 chapters uh, that the author of Hebrews, usually Paul, is considered to be the author of Hebrews. He basically uh, tries to persuade re the readers that nobody ever was saved by deeds. It was always by faith, always. And here he also stops on the topic of the faith and, and now expands it uh, to its maximum. So first verse, 
Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This word uh, of being sure, it, it means like the essence. So essence of uh, what we hope for. MacArthur says that uh, faith is the essence of the future reality. Peter Bryan said, faith is something objective that here and now uh, brings true reality uh, and that will be uh, revealed in its time by God. So faith is the tool from God by which we understand the reality. And I would like to compare the faith to the virus. There is some similarity. There is a virus which we do not see, but we feel its effect. And faith is the same. We don't see it. We don't see the invisible world, but we feel the effects of this. We see how it is expressed in our life. For example, the virus, coronavirus, you can deny it. Some people do not believe that, uh, that people get sick from coronavirus. In the same manner, you can deny that all the actions that happen in our world or happen in our life, that it has something to do with God's invisible world. People say, no, it's maybe a chaos or some, uh, some accidents, or they do not really uh, connect it to, to faith. But faith connects us to God's invisible world, what really happens in our life. There is another phrase, <coughs> phrase here, it's being certain of what we do not see. Faith, it's uh, confidence, if, uh, confidence of something invisible. This faith, or this confidence, literally it means it's more reliable, more objective than our other physical feelings that we have. Uh, adore and, and like, by the way, it is easily lost <laughs> with coronavirus and, or you can touch something or hearing or seeing. So this can fail more than your faith would fail. Sometimes I think that I saw something, but then I, I start out, and did I really see that? So you can't always really uh, uh, count on, on what you saw. <clears throat> your feelings is the same. I saw one TV show about a man a man was blindfolded and he had to find his wife out of five uh, uh, different ladies. Oh, you can make a mistake out there. So all our physical feelings are not reliable enough, but faith is reliable. But there is a different kind, kinds of faith. There is faith which is built on some fantasies, whether demon's fantasy or human's fantasy. It's not an objective faith. It's not about what what is real in the invisible world. So this is a wrong faith. But we <coughs> rely on the objective physical reality. <coughs> but in order to have such faith, certain conditions must be met. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, <coughs> Uh, however, it is, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. But God has relieved it is to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among the men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given to us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by, uh, by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truth in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual ma man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject uh, to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. It's thanks to this spirit we can enter this invisible world. The human wisdom cannot do that, or human spirit. So, uh, 
some those other people they think that this foolishness uh, to believe some invisible world uh, because they do not have uh, the spirit they cannot understand this but there is one very important question is the faith a gift of God or the ability of man <coughs> I realize this is not an easy question and so the answer will not be a comprehensive fully full answer but it's important to think about that because uh, our responsibility depend on that if our faith is our responsibility then we must believe but if it is only the gift of God then we only need to wait for God to give it to us to pre then we are like not responsible for our faith my personal position is that faith is both uh, my responsibility and God's gift <coughs> <clears throat> For example, here in verse 6 we read that it's impossible to please God without faith. <clears throat> so you must believe. And by the way, you can only come to God by faith. That's the only foundation to start pleasing God. Jesus, for example, very often says to his disciples, you of little faith. He doesn't say go and, and lay there and wait until it enlightens you. No, he expected some faith from them and he says you little of, uh, of little faith. On the other hand, Jesus says to Peter when uh, he confessed that uh, Christ was the Son of God, he said it's not your own idea but uh, this, the Spirit of God revealed it to you. So it's like a double impact of faith. So on the one hand, it's very obvious that God calls us to believe his word, and this is our responsibility. On the other hand, it is also quite obvious that it depends on God. So we cannot uh, really control God by our faith. It's not the tool uh, by which we can uh, control God. This is the channel uh, that God revealed to us, and we can believe by uh, obeying his word. We, we even must do that. Some Christians... Uh, are worried if some people believed in God, some others did not believe in God, then those who believed in God, they kind of earned something or they deserved it. Uh, they are some kind better than others. But there is a mistake here that, that the concepts of uh, deeds and the concept of faith are in different categories. Deeds are something that I deserve. Uh, faith is the uh, category of mercy. It's something that is given to me by, uh, as a present. So you cannot really earn something or you cannot even deserve something by faith. Uh, I'll give you a few passages. <coughs> Romans uh, 4, starting with verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. If he deserved his salvation well done good job God is uh, what does the scripture say Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness no he received it by faith that was given to him and it was counted as his. now when a man works his wages are not credited to him as a gift but as an obligation However, to the man who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. So God <coughs> gave it to him uh, by mercy. Also Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So we see these are different categories. <coughs> and... I'll give a short conclusion. Faith, whether it's our responsibility or gift of God, faith is our ability and our responsibility before God. All people believe something. When a person decides to trust the Lord, he makes a step towards the Lord and the Lord reveals himself and his word. As it is said, uh, the faith is from here and hearing is from the word of God. How would you believe if uh, you don't hear and how would someone hear if no, nobody preaches? <coughs> Anybody who believes in the word of God will be accepted. He will not be denied. Therefore, 
it's like a double-sided thing. We must uh, do certain steps of faith towards God. It's the only God, uh, way of pleasing God. As we can only come to God by faith, as we have nothing else to come to Him with. Second verse in, in Hebrews 11. <coughs> it is says, this is what the ancients were commanded for. <coughs> Another translation can be said that they were approved by God. The ancient, the ancients described here and throughout the whole history of humankind, they were commanded for or they were approved by God. It's only about them, God says, that they pleased me. And also some other passages prove that place where it says it's impossible to please God without faith. And a bit later it is written that uh, the whole world were not worthy of them. So those people of faith uh, very often lived in difficult conditions and they did not really look as uh, the strong people of this world. Quite the opposite. And, and God says, these people of faith, the whole world was not worthy of them. This is how God considers people of faith. <coughs> Verse 3 says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. The whole universe was created by the Word of God. This verse is basically a good test on the, on the truthfulness of biblical faith. Now it's quite fashionable uh, that God created the world not within seven days, but within seven stages, or God has started the process and then uh, the evolution started. No. Uh, by the Word of God, the universe was created, and I think uh, uh, the biblical faith should bring uh, you to the understanding that it was not a problem for God to create the universe in seven days. Let's try to think more about another fundamental issue. Think, please, why faith? Why did God establish this particular tool, faith, uh, for us to have relationship with Him? Think, why do you think Adam and Eve, did they need faith? perfect people without sin who had communion with God alive. Did they really need faith? Jenny understood very quickly. Uh, it took me many, many hours to understand uh, this issue. I heard this idea that Ed Adam and Eve did not need faith because they saw God alive and they were perfect people, so why would they need to believe? But in reality, they needed faith. Basically, they needed the same kind of faith that we have because there was something into what they were supposed to believe. And for us, it is now, it's not something that we are supposed to believe because we see it now. When God has commanded to Adam uh, not to eat from a specific tree in the garden, and then a sanction, if you uh, break that rule, you will die by death. Adam and Eve lived in a wonderful world. Everything was perfect, everything was blooming. They didn't see death. Nowhere around them they saw death. Therefore, for Adam and Eve to believe that after they break this uh, commandment, a death will come, they had to enter the invisible world, because at that time uh, death did not exist. It was beyond visible things. They had to believe something that they didn't see before. So basically they needed the same 
belief or the same faith in God's word. We, uh, like in the mirrored situation from them, we live in the world where we see death on every corner. We don't need to believe in death because it came, we, we see it uh, very often. Everything dies, everything destroys, uh, is being destroyed, we see it. But what do we need to believe in? We need to believe in the eternal life. But we don't see eternal life. We heard about it, we know that Jesus is the eternal life, we know that we expect eternal life, but it's still the invisible world for us and we must believe in it. So we must believe the same uh, God's word. And we s make a conclusion from that, that God from the very beginning has defined a faith and his word as the main tool of communication with him. Adam and Eve, they were not sinful. They could not commit sin before their uh, fall. <coughs> and when they made the, like, uh, this uh, wreck of faith, they, they sinned. So when they stopped believing God's word, they sinned. But after the fall, this is what happens. another one or more elements are added to faith. First, God uh, has separated from the sinful person and became unaccessible for a sinful person. And therefore, everybody who uh, comes into this world must believe that God exists. And a person cannot be in God's uh, presence because otherwise uh, God's presence would immediately destroy that sinner. And so God if previously uh, the foundation for uh, Adam and Eve's faith was uh, the command not to eat uh, from a specific uh, tr uh, tree, then now uh, the foundation is a gospel in uh, Genesis 3.15. Uh, God speaks to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Uh, in order to decode this uh, biblically, this is what it says. The, uh, uh, the Satan's offspring will fight against the offspring of the woman, and uh, the offspring of Satan is basically the whole humankind. And the offspring of woman is the future Messiah, which for us, uh, he already was born. And Satan will uh, strike his heel. Most likely it's speaking about uh, his, uh, uh, his stand on the cross, his crucifixion. But as soon as Jesus resurrected from death, he basically crushed the head of Satan, totally crushed him. This is the gospel that was given to Adam and Eve. Starting from this moment, the essence of biblical faith is the sacrifice of Messiah, sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For the people of the Old Testament, Messiah who was supposed to come, for all the New, New Testament believers, Messiah who already came. So a person in the garden has lost his righteousness. He used to have it, he had this righteousness, God had communication with him. Maybe people even were enlightened or they, they uh, because it was written, they had the glory of God. Most likely they, they had this enlightenment around them, but it's just my uh, guess. And so they had the righteousness, then they lose it, God separates from them. And now the person needs to get back that righteousness somehow. And by faith, as we sang today the song, uh, by your righteousness. And the Bible says it's the righteousness of Christ that credited to us. Now the person cannot, uh, cannot really keep any commandment. By being obedient or by keeping the commandment, you cannot really restore any righteousness. So now the person must believe into someone 
who dies instead of him on the cross, and then this righteousness is credited to him. And that's how the communication can be restored. So the root of the biblical faith uh, was only through the faith in the future Messiah, who was Jesus Christ. Because by believing that, we see everywhere in the scripture, from the very beginning of the scripture, that God credited faith as righteousness. Uh, now God looks at the believer and says, yes, I see you uh, uh, as a righteous person, as, right, as righteous as my uh, son. That's why we can have communication with God now. <clears throat> this is what, what is different about faith. And we read this in about Abel and Enoch and Noah. It's always by faith. And this was the faith, uh, the righteousness that was credited. It, it was substituted. Uh, it was basically the righteousness of Christ that was given to us as a present. So that people would understand this truth uh, more clearly, God immediately uh, establishes the system of sacrifices. And we see even here uh, on the example of Abel and Cain, the third and the fourth people on the earth, uh, most likely God established it immediately after he gave the clothes to Adam and Eve. So now the person, in order to have some access to God, he must get some uh, sacrifice that would be like a substitution for his punishment. And then he gives in the law of Moses uh, some clarifications that uh, the lamp would be killed on, on, on the Passover, on the Easter. And he, that lamp would, would have to stay in your uh, house for 14 days so that it would not be an easy sacrifice for you, but that you would really understand what it is for. Uh, as, so that all your feelings would uh, preach to you that you must have substitutional sacrifice. You cannot come to me in your current state. So the first main characteristic of biblical faith is this. Biblical faith has to do with the uh, relying on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's the center of uh, the believing faith in Jesus Christ. Any faith that is not connected to it is not a biblical faith. It is written that demons believe and they are uh, shivering. But their faith is not a biblical faith. Uh, it's not, uh, their faith is not relying on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So getting back to the question, why did God establish faith as an instrument to have communication with him? <clears throat> my answer is this. My first answer was this. Because a, a human is a sinful person and you cannot please God, uh, as it is written in the Bible. But wouldn't perfect Adam and Eve, uh, uh, did they uh, please God by their deeds? I would say no, they could not please God by their deeds. They, yes, they were perfect, they didn't sin, but how could they please God? Their holiness was complete, God's, uh, it's, it was not their achievement. Uh, God created them that way. By the way, some theologists say that Adam and Eve basically sinned at the same day. So it was very, very quick process. But it's, you know, there are some hints that it, it indeed it happened quite quickly. Maybe not the same day, but quite quickly. So God, God did not expect good deeds from them. No, he expected faith from them. If they kept faith, they would not fall down. So what's the, the major reason? reason? why God gives faith? The answer is this. The main reason why God has established faith for us to have fellowship with Him is His glory. <coughs> it's another huge topic, uh, heavy topic, very often not uh, well understood. God's glory. For example, if we read Ephesians, uh, you can read chapter 1 or 2, Basically, it claims in every verse, God saved us, God died for us, for His glory. So that all of that would glorify his, uh, he, Himself. Quite often, not understanding God's glory and such position of God, for example, 
God says, I will not give my glory to anyone. So this misunderstanding brings uh, uh, to the fact that even believers uh, start thinking that God is kind of, uh, he's not just God. And by the way, it was a great temptation for Satan. <coughs> So basically, Satan said, God, please share your glory. I want to be like you. I want to have my own throne. Satan, uh, basically, the idea was that I want also to be to some independent of you. I, can, I want to, to be able to give life, to, to give some essence to, to others. So basically, he's offered some alternative reality. And the third part of angels followed him. Yeah, there is a chance to live differently. And the same happened to a human. He says, look, God doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want to share his glory with you. And the person was tempted. The human was tempted. The humankind fell. Of course, the matter of God's glory is worthy of considering uh, separately, but I will just touch it lightly. What is God's glory? So I was reading the text and I was writing down, not not necessarily in the proper order, just in general, what, what I saw when I read Ephesians and other passages. God's glory is the, uh, c uh, the agreement that only God is the source of life, only God is the source of anything good, that there is nothing impossible for Him that he is not under anybody, but he is above everyone. Uh, the time does not influence him. He is perfect in his love. He is perfect in everything. And there is no, none like him. He is totally different. Therefore, when God uh, wants to have the whole glory, this is just the reality. It's just a part of his nature. He does not bow to anyone or doesn't worship anyone because there is none like him. When creature uh, tries to claim uh, their independence out, uh, outside of God or without God, it just doesn't correspond to reality. Without God, everything dies. Glory, uh, basically, a uh, translation of the word glory is uh, like heaviness. And only God can carry it. Uh, everybody else will be crushed under this uh, heavy weight. James says, don't be deceived, my brothers, that any anything good comes from from the Father who is unchanged. So we see that God is a unique uh, person, unique personality, and only He has got the source of life. O only in Him anything can live. If something is uh, disconnected from this source of life, he or she dies, or that thing dies. And if somebody tells you worship me, I can make you happy, it just, he is a, it's, it's a, a someone who steals God's throne. A few conclusions from this idea. As soon as someone starts claiming autonomy and self-dependence, it brings only to destruction. That was the cause of third part of angel to fall. And when God says, I will not give my glory to anyone, it just corresponds to the reality, corresponds to the truth. It's like others start imitating God, then it's an idol, it cannot give anything good. Second, God is loving and kind. He created us uh, so that we would be uh, happy in Him, totally happy in Him. So can we, how can we be tempted that uh, God expects the whole glory and our love will be towards Him. This is correct, because it's how we uh, receive the full happiness, because God wants us to be happy. <coughs> this idea of independence, uh, uh, this is a wrong uh, way of thinking. It's sinful. It's the attempt to restore the lost righteousness by our own deeds. It's it's lie, it's sinfulness. Basically, it's the root of our problems. Therefore, God so loves us, uh, He's so wonderful, and He wants us to be so happy 
uh, that we should not be tempted by, by the fact that all the glory should belong to God. Besides, God is not uh, greedy on his glory. It is written that God shares his glory. Uh, as it is written, uh, those who praise me, I praise them. And Christ will be glorified in us, in his church. Therefore, we are uh, the f uh, kind of the meditators of, or we bring God's glory to this world. <clears throat> so what does it mean for us? We must understand the uh, essence of our faith. Why does God expect faith? Because faith is the dependency on God. Faith is walking before the Lord uh, in humbleness, and there is no uh, place for pride. It's a modest view of, him, of yourself. Faith is uh, admission that everything good in our life is God's mercy, and only by faith we can believe in God. We can glorify God. So it was like a big uh, introduction about faith, and, and it's important to, to understand this because in the next uh, illustrations, and we'll consider just one today, it will be uh, expressed better. We'll only be able to look at Abel and Cain today, but we had to understand the essence of faith, what it is. <clears throat> so verse 4 of Hebrews 11, uh, story about Abel and Cain. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commanded as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. Abel and Cain, the third and the fourth people of the universe. We get back to the Genesis, the beginning of creation, when Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden and the uh, angel was protecting <coughs> the garden. Uh, most likely it was contemporary Iraq or Mesopotamia. Maybe they could even come closer to the angel with the sword. Maybe even there there was some s sacrifice, but it's all just guesses. <coughs> uh, Genesis chapter 4. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord I have brought forth a man. Cain literally means I got something, or, or some others say it means uh, he is here. It's really difficult to understand the true meaning of the world in such an ancient language. Most likely it happened quite quickly after they were expelled from the garden. And so what could Eve think when she gave birth to Cain? Why did she give him such a name? They were in the garden, everything was great. And then the fall happens and God gives them some hope. And he says, in the offspring of the woman, there will be someone who will deliver them from the consequences of sin, who will deliver them from Satan. Of course, they had this fresh uh, promise and they expected and, and that. And then the first person, person is, uh, is born and she says, I have brought forth a man. This is just a, a guess, but pretty, pretty much uh, educated guess or uh, quite truthful guess. So she thought that was the savior. He, she thought that that was the man from the Lord. But actually, it was the man from Satan. In First John, it is written, Cain, who was from the devil and, and uh, killed his brother. It was not from the Lord. No, it was from Satan by his spiritual nature. In First John 3, 12, uh, Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. By the way, uh, some people like to get deeper. In, in the first uh, gospel, like in uh, Genesis 3.15, it says that uh, from the offspring uh, of, of woman he will be born, and f from the seed of the woman. But w woman cannot have a seed. It's, it's uh, this man have seed. And even here, it's like a hint that will be 
uh, saver born without the participation of a man. And this is what happened. Uh, so we read the gospel that was written in the first uh, in the first uh, uh, century, and you can see that this is a wonderful construction. It it really amazes me how God's word is uh, created. The more you learn it, the more you understand this. Uh, mutual connections and and the more you are amazed of it uh, and just human cannot write such things then Abel is born uh, because uh, it is written later she gave birth to his brother Abel maybe immediately maybe they were born uh, like together uh, now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil it's interesting that uh, the name Abel means also ha has some meaning. It's like a sh short breath. His life was, was very short because uh, his brother did kill him. And yet, with his short life, uh, we can read that Abel preaches even after his death. So uh, his uh, life in terms of eternity is not so short. Verse 3, Genesis 4. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Let's analyze. By the way, starting from verse 3, we understand that there the sacrifices were established at that time. They knew how to uh, bring sacrifices, and they basically knew what to bring and, and how to bring that. So there was uh, the sacrificial system established by that time. So let's compare the difference, how Cain and Abel brought their offerings. Why did God accept it? the first person and didn't accept another person. First, Abel brought uh, the animal and Cain brought, uh, uh, brought some plants. Cain brought uh, the first uh, thing. Cain brought uh, with a different uh, uh, state of heart rather than Abel. So it is written, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but in Cain and his offering, he didn't look with favor. And even in John, we read, First John, that uh, his deeds were righteous ones, the other deeds were not the righteous ones. Could you bring uh, not only the animal as an offering, by the law of Moses, which didn't exist at that time yet, uh, as a substitutional sacrifice, it could it must uh, be only an animal, always just an animal. Most likely, <coughs> it was a clear God's command to bring the first of the firstborn, the firstborn of, of the flock. Or So God looked at the heart. As it was written in Psalm 50, the sacrifice for God is this crushed spirit. Abel had that because God looked at him with favor. What else did God see in Abel and Cain's heart? Abel brought the uh, sacrifice of faith. Faith into whom or into what? Faith in Genesis 3.15. <coughs> faith in the future Messiah. Abel did everything correctly. He, cons uh, he realized he was a sinner. He understood he could not come close to God. He relied on the gospel that was given to his parents. And he realized that for me to get closer to this holy God, I, as a sinner, must bring the sacrifice. It's a symbolic sacrifice that points to the perfect sacrifice that will happen later. So he had faith and uh, at the heart of his faith was the gospel. So he, the righteousness of the future Messiah credited to him by faith. <coughs> Cain also came with faith, but 
uh, the center of that faith was not uh, the gospel, or, but his own uh, value. Basically, it tells a lot that Cain came to the Lord. Most likely, he came with self, uh, with self uh, kind of glory. He didn't know the death yet, and the, uh, basically the effect of sin was not so strong yet. He thought, well, life is perfect. Everything's fine with me. I, so he came to God. Yes, I want to offer him to, to serve God. I'll, I'll just uh, impress God uh, with my sacrifice. Here, God, look at me. If it was not his intentions, why then did he get so angry uh, when God didn't accept his sacrifice? Most likely he had some expectations that God will, will uh, kind of will say well done to him. And so, and his brother reminded him of this uh, basically humiliation that, <coughs> that God accepted his brother but not him. Cain is the founder of the false religion of deeds. In the center of this false religion are human uh, achievements. It is says in the scripture that the deeds of Cain were evil. By the way, from the outside they may not necessarily look like that. Maybe by that time Cain looked pretty nice person, pretty successful person, until some catalyzer appeared as a catalyzer of his mo true motives. <coughs> and so this brother, Abel, just revealed the root of his deeds. When a person thinks of himself that he is not such a bad person, <coughs> he basically tries to say that he can be good without God. But anything that is done without God are by its nature evil. Because without God, a person, a human, can only bring evil, no matter how well it may look. Notice how our good deeds become not very good ones when they are not uh, assessed uh, as, as we expect. We get uh, angry. Why was not I accepted? I am not worse than that person. And people say, no, God, it's, everything's fine. We have nothing against Christ. But as soon as the authority of Christ uh, enters the life of a person, the person starts hating Christ. I am the boss here, uh, the boss myself. I control my life. And somebody uh, wants me to kneel down to him. <coughs> and then everything in the person just uh, is revealed. That's why it is written in Revelation that when Christ gets down with the church, all the other countries will unite together and will fight against them. The whole world will will fight against Christ, whom they will see. So a human does not uh, uh, hates God, sorry, hates God, and because his deeds are evil. Practical uh, application for us. Abel, as it is written, he speaks with his death even today. What does it uh, say to us even today? And not only uh, his faith, but false faith of Cain. First, we only can uh, uh, access God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. First John chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. It is applicable to us. We can only uh, achieve, uh, or we can only come to God thanks to Jesus Christ. We must always remember about that. It's not our uh, achievement. It was given by Him. He is uh, the one who is speaking in our defense. Second, uh, this illustration teaches us that we must be obedient to God's word. Many people serve God as Cain. They decide themselves how to better please God. Cain was supposed to 
speak to his brother and, and bring the animal, but he decided to, to do his own things. And so there will be plenty of such canes uh, on, in the court at the end. Matthew 7. <coughs> Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did, did we not prof prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell you them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, your evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So basically, Jesus say to those people who consider themselves Christians, uh, he will say to them, no, you, you did something in your own agenda, but you didn't uh, obey what I told you to, to do. From this text in Matthew, I would like to define several categories of people that we could apply it. There are different uh, categories of believers. First, these are like clear unbelievers, obvious unbelievers, when agnostics or it's quite obvious, it's quite clear. This person does not have any faith uh, in God at all. Second category of people is written here in these verses. People, they say they believe and they serve God in the name of Jesus Christ. What I will say, there are two problems with them. First, they serve God uh, in their own manner, just as they thought would be correct, just as Cain did. There is no true faith in such service, because the true faith brings uh, the obedience of God's word. And we read that there will be plenty of such people on the court. I think in our situation it can look like this. If <coughs> Uh, I'll say a, a bit later that. So first problem, they served the way they wanted. And second, basically they say, please let us enter the kingdom of God. We did it for your name, in your name. Nobody said to them, Jesus, let me go into your heaven because you died instead of me. Such person will not be rejected. So these people basically relied on their own deeds, no matter how important impressive deeds they did. Therefore, we must analyze ourselves and uh, keep asking ourselves a question, whose will do I commit, uh, do I uh, follow, my will or God's will? Do I only do what is comfortable for me? When it's painful, when it's uh, shame, shameful, we can love, uh, love the gospel like, you know, uh, selectively. Some parts we accept, some parts we do not accept. And the third category of people are uh, very close to us. People who come to the uh, uh, biblical church and they, on the outward, they, they basically accept everything. We look at them and yes, we say such people are believers, but what can be the problem with them? The problem might be that in the heart they do not have the uh, understanding of their sinfulness and their need in Jesus Christ. Sometimes we all tend to forget about that. I'm not saying we are not believers. Of course, we are not perfect in, of, in our faith. But we must have this understanding of our uh, sinfulness and our need in, in the Lord. It all goes together. By the way, those of you who read, Kolya, uh, uh, our pastor, wrote uh, a letter from from his ho from the hospital. It's a very good example. And one point that I noticed, I, I've known him for many years. Yes, he's uh, he re he really understands that this is all by Christ through so many years of faith and so, man, so much obedience, I've, I've read, praise God, Kola, you truly have a living example of faith to which we can follow. 
No matter what we do, we must remember that we can do nothing without Jesus Christ. So, the faith of Abel teaches us and reminds us that we are accepted by God only based on the sacrificial uh, offering of Jesus Christ. Every, all the glory goes to Him. <clears throat> also, it reminds us that we should not rely on our own deeds. The whole glory belongs to Christ. In the scripture, it says that we can be brave having such faith that we have the access through Jesus Christ uh, and we must use the, Him and we must come to, to the throne of grace having this faith in Jesus Christ in order to receive faith and mercy and, and help when it's needed. There is a great... Uh, uh, great richness in this faith and God wants us to come to him in this manner because God is pleased with his son who died for our uh, sins and who gave us his righteousness. Amen.